I'm Nikki Jovicic from Look Up Strata and also the Managing Director of Tower Body Corporate, a Queensland body corporate management company. I'm your host for today's session and we welcome back Bruce McKenzie from Sedgwick and we welcome for the first time Yolanda Nice and Elizabeth Stewart from the Office of the New South Wales Building Commissioner. The panel has joined us today to explain what Project Intervene is and how it may be able to help your building resolve serious defects. The deadline for registering for the project is the 30th of June 2023, so now is the time to register. Project Intervene aims to avoid costly and time-consuming legal options like going to court or the tribunal, and one of the major benefits of Project Intervene is there is no cost to the owner's corporation. The developer pays for the remediation works and all associated costs. We'd like to remind everyone that this is a New South Wales session and it is applicable to owners corporations within the state of New South Wales. Before we begin, I'd like to mention that the information in this session, including the discussions that arise from submitted questions and the chat conversations, is not legal advice and should not be relied upon as legal advice. You should seek independent advice before acting on the information contained in the session. We welcome Yolanda Nice, Program Manager at New South Wales Department of Customer Service. Yolanda has more than 20 years experience in the New South Wales Public Service. She's worked in disciplinary action units in home building and compensation funds and has been responsible for high level stakeholder engagement. In 2019, the newly appointed building commissioner, David Chandler, invited Yolanda to play a critical role in delivering Construct New South Wales, a major once in a generation reform program to transform the New South Wales construction industry. Yolanda has led the development and implementation of Project Intervene as its program manager. We also have Elizabeth Stewart, Director Legal at the Office of the New South Wales Building Commissioner. Elizabeth is a lawyer who's worked in government construction and property for over 20 20 years and has been a part of the Office of the New South Wales Building Commissioner since 2019, providing legal and project support. Elizabeth is very keen on this Construct New South Wales reforms because they offer a sound alternative for the resolution of defects and also in the upskilling of the industry working on residential apartment buildings, so they are, they are after your defects in the future. And we also are delighted to welcome back Bruce McKenzie from Sedgwick. And Bruce has had over 30 years experience in the building industry. Currently, Bruce is the National Manager for Commercial Services and Major Projects at Sedgwick. In 2022, Bruce commenced a secondment with the Office of the New South Wales Building Commissioner to launch Project Intervene. Bruce is the Acting Program Director and has developed and implemented the program, including the management of a panel of project managers and experts. Good morning, everyone. Okay, how did we get here? So the New South Wales Building Reforms is a class two sector initially focused on preventing serious defects from arising during the design and building and construction phases of new buildings. But there was always an intention to respond to unresolved serious defects in residential apartment buildings. To understand the uh, nature and prevalence of serious defects in um, apartment buildings, the uh, Office of Building Commissioner partnered with SCA New South Wales to conduct a survey of buildings that are up to six years old. The survey found that in 39% of buildings, there was at least one serious defect in the common property. But as few as 15% of those buildings formally reported their serious defects to New South Wales Fair Trading, instead primarily pursuing legal proceedings to have the serious defects resolved. The survey also found that of the matters uh, pursuing litigation, only 4% had some success in getting those serious defects fixed. So Project Intervene provides an alternative to pursuing litigation. It is taking a different approach. So Project Intervene is a New South Wales government initiative to assist owners corporations have their serious defects remediated um, in the common property of their building, where there is uh, an active developer or builder still available. The program is a, is a surge project, um, which is being offered for a limited time, and it is using outsourced resources so that the program can scale up as required. 
The Project Intervene has engaged Sedgwick Australia to manage a panel of contractors that will carry out the investigation work and report on serious defects. The program uses powers uh, under the Residential Apartment Buildings Compliance Enforcement Powers Act um, that commenced on 1 September 2020. This is quite a game-changing piece of legislation in New South Wales. Um, it allows the regulator to um, collect documentation, conduct inspections during the construction as well as uh, completed phases of, the, of buildings. The legislation, I'm going to call it the RAB Act, allows the regulator to issue stop work orders or prohibition orders where um, an occupation certificate has not been issued for a building, as well as issue building work rectification orders, um, as well as accept undertakings from developers for serious defects that have been identified in the building. So the program focuses on um, serious defects in the building, and this is defined in the RAB Act. Now, important features of Project Intervene. There must be um, a developer and builder still trading to ensure that we can compel them to remediate the serious defects, as well as uh, obviously bear the cost for the remediation work, so that there is no cost to the owners corporation who participate in the program. The Owners Corporation have to register or uh, opt in for the program. Um, it is also open to ICERT rated developers to put forward their building to be part of the program. The program is designed to uh, negotiate an undertaking with the developer to have the serious defects remediated. And we'll talk a little bit more about that um, in, in this presentation. Where we cannot achieve an undertaking from the developer, we will then consider issuing a building work rectification order to the developer to have the serious defects remediated. I've spoken about serious defects. The program is looking at serious defects in the common property. Now, serious defects is defined in the RAB Act as um, a failure to comply with the performance requirements of the BCA or Australian standards in relation to the five building elements which is defined in the Design and Building Practitioners Act, which relate to the fire safety systems, waterproofing, essential services, which relate to the mechanical services, hydraulic systems, um, electrical services, the enclosure of the building, which is you know, your roof, your walls, windows, doors, the cladding of the building, and obviously the structure of the building. Now, um, hand over to Bruce McKenzie to talk a little bit Bit more about the the inspection side of the program. Thanks, Yolanda. As um, was pointed out, those five elements, and I'll talk a little bit about each of those elements, most people would be probably thinking what qualifies, what is a serious defect. Sometimes it needs explanation, I guess, to, to get to the bottom of what um, does constitute a serious defect. Um, really, in short term, anything that does affect the amenity, uh, the occupation of the building, they're good examples, and, and things like structural are quite obvious. But um, the first element we'll talk about is waterproofing on the screen there. Uh, and this is what we're referring to as some really typical things we're seeing on most buildings. So we're quite a few buildings into the program now, and we're starting to see a lot of trends on, on what is coming up most common. Um, mould uh, and water uh, ingress, the image on the right hand side there is, is quite typical. That would be from a, uh, obviously some sort of issue or problem up above, uh, most likely a, a membrane failure or something like that. Um, the image on the left, I would have to say, is, is almost evident on most buildings. Um, and what that is, is, is water ingress into basement car park areas or, or stairwell areas like that. Um, most of those areas uh, should have a, a membrane system or a drywall system in place to prevent that water from coming in, um, creating moisture, creating mould, dampness, um, and things that do contribute to what is classified as a serious defect. Uh, under the RAB Act. So, um, so in terms of waterproofing, I think um, they're just a few examples. There's lots of um, different examples in that area, um, particularly planter boxes on rooftops, um, balconies and roofs are, are also other examples of um, normal typical defects um, in, in that waterproofing element. So structural um, is reasonably obvious, but, um, but certainly cracking Cracking in concrete substrates in structural elements uh, in basements um, is a very typical one. So 
Um, we are, again, are unfortunately seeing a lot of this. Um, and I think the examples there, the example on the right hand side is, is showing um, seepage coming through from up above. That seepage ordinarily wouldn't occur um, if there wasn't some sort of a, a crack or a, an avenue for that water to come through. So the evidence is quite clear um, when you do see it. Um, and, and that is um, something that, that happens quite often. Uh, the image on the left is cracking in concrete. We do see a lot of hairline cracks um, quite often. Um, they might be classified as a serious defect. Cracking uh, does occur in concrete just about all the time from a shrinkage point of view, but it's more the serious cracks we're looking at. So it's over the, the three millimetres and larger is where it is constituted as a, um, something that's going to impact the structural integrity of the of the uh, of the substrate, so that they're, they're the sort of things we're looking for, and, and typically movement and that sort of thing. And the image on the left hand side, you can see that there's been a bit of movement there, so that is definitely classified as a um, as a serious defect. Um, the other things we do often see too is honey, what's referred to as honeycombing, um, which is where concrete hasn't been. Uh, compacted properly and you can see through that concrete often you can see the reinforcement and the steel which might be corroding uh, again typical examples of, of structural um, structural defects that would classify as a serious defect under project intervene so we're getting into some elements now fire and one in particular that i think um, for strata managers and owners that some of these issues are probably not as evident to the naked eye and you wouldn't observe these ordinarily uh, walking around your building but um, some good examples the one on the right hand side is what's referred to as an unprotected uh, fire penetration or opening um, and what that refers to in, in each building, um, there's fire compartments and that could be a, an electrical cupboard or a, a pump room. Um, and that, that's uh, in a basement and it could extend up levels um, to various levels of a building. There's service shafts that run through all of your uh, service cupboards on each level of your building that, that are out in those common areas. There's gotta be fire protection between those levels to stop a fire from starting on one level and, and jumping to the next level and, and obviously building. And uh, what's totally critical is, is the, the sealing of those penetrations because we do have services passing through from floor to floor. They've gotta be sealed properly so that fire can't pass through. And it's a very typical common defect we find where they haven't been attended to properly. It's not sealed properly. They haven't used the right material or they just simply haven't done it. So, um, so that classifies as a serious defect. Um, the one on the left-hand side, another common one as well, fire sprinklers. Um, this is a, a good example of lack of coordination on a building where the sprinkler fitters come in early, they've fitted all their sprinklers throughout the car park area. And it looks like the mechanical contractor who installs the duct work has come in later. They've installed ducts directly below a sprinkler and uh, a sprinkler needs to be 100% unobstructed. So when it goes off naturally, it can have the proper impact that it needs to extinguish um, anything that's on fire. So that sprinkler has been impeded. It's not going to work effectively and it's non-compliant. So again, a, a very typical example we see, the failure there is coordination. Um, the, the services weren't coordinated before they were installed and, and we've ended up with a clash that, that um, creates a breach. Building enclosure, so what building enclosure is, is by definition the, the outside of your building and, and there's lots of examples of that. We've got a couple on the screen there, but it's generally any kind of water ingress. Um, the, the enclosure of your building is there to, and designed to keep um, water and um, moisture out. Um, and so anything from cavity flashings to, to, to windows to doors, um, these are some um, more um, common or, or, or um, defects we've seen on buildings, um, cracking of a facade on the right hand side, that's like a render strip or a, a facade strip that's failing and coming off. Um, the one on the left hand side, shattered balustrades, another um, one we have seen on occasions where the glass has not been compliant or uh, not been installed properly and it's received pressures from um, movement in the building and, it, and it's created a, an issue where it's cracked. So, um, so they're just some examples of what building enclosure means. Um, some other um, examples, like I said, is moisture man management and just suitable materials being used. Um, combustible cladding is another example of what is a, a a serious defect, although that's um, being managed by a separate program um, through the Department of Customer Service, but um, but it is an example of something, uh, a non-compliant cladding product um, does contribute to a, a serious defect in a building. 
and then the final one um, is, is essential services. Again, this is an element um, that's probably not as, as obvious to most owners and, um, and to strata managers. Um, the image on the right hand side is merely just showing a fire hydrant um, um, arrangement on a building. But what we are finding through audit is a lot of um, non-compliance issues. And these are things to do with the heights that the hydrants are supposed to be installed at. Clearances is a really good example. There's supposed to be clearances where um, the fire brigade can connect to certain points and be unobstructed. Um, and, and sometimes um, we find absence where there isn't a hydrant in a stairwell or somewhere where there should be a hydrant um, to comply with the building code. So they're um, things, uh, again, they're not necessarily visible to the naked eye for most owners, but we do pick this up um, when the inspections are undertaken. And they're, again, classified as serious because uh, obviously your hydrant system on any building is critical for uh, the event of a fire. The one on the left hand side, node of ventilation, this is quite common in a lot of uh, common areas and it could be through basement areas, service cupboards or, or different areas, there needs to be ventilation installed. And we do find instances where that hasn't been done. So um, it makes the, the space um, a dangerous space that when it hasn't got the proper airflow it, it has. And if, it's, uh, if there's gas meters or anything like that in there, it is critical that it does have that ventilation. So they're good examples of um, essential services um, to do with mechanical, there's fire, and of course, electrical and other services come into that as well. Uh, Non-compliances with switchboards and, and other areas like that. So they're um, probably what we uh, come across the most. So I might cross back over, Yolanda, you might want to talk through that one in terms of the process. Thank you, Bruce. So this is just a very high level process of Project Intervene. So buildings um, that meet the obviously eligibility criteria should register for the program. When we receive a registration, we will check eligibility based on whether there is a active developer or builder, whether there's serious defects somehow um, identified in the building. And also looking at, we're primarily focused around uh, buildings that are up to six years old even though the, the RAB Act says we can um, have a look at defects up to 10 years old, because we the main focus of this program. Once buildings are eligible for the program, we will carry out an inspection of the building to identify any serious defects. Any defects that have been identified will be put into a report, which will be issued to the developer. We will also issue a draft building work rectification order, setting out the defects that we have observed and inviting the developer to provide, you know, a way to resolve it. Primarily what we're looking at is trying to get to a negotiate an undertaking with the developer. So this is a part where we call a fork in the road for the developer. We will push to negotiate an undertaking because that's the, the model that Project Intervene has developed because it has um, various features that we'll talk to a little bit later, where we cannot achieve an undertaking, a final building work rectification order will be issued to the developer to uh, remediate the serious defects. I'll hand over to Elizabeth to talk to the undertaking process. Thanks, Yolanda. So there are two main uh, documents in the undertaking process. They are the process deed poll which essentially is an agreement by the developer to enter into the planning phase of the undertaking um, that we want them to enter into. And the second and binding document is the undertaking. The process deed poll is basically an agreement to work with us, um, the undertaking manager when they're appointed and the owners corporation to identify a list of serious defects and to get the owners corporation to essentially sign up for project intervene as the pathway to get the defects remediated. Yolanda will talk a bit more about the benefits of project intervene and this process a bit later, but I'll just say that um, we do prefer for developers to come down the pathway of the undertaking because although we will still issue a final building work rectification order where we see serious defects that are not remediated, if the developer complies with that, it's a good outcome, the defects are fixed. If the developer doesn't comply with the building work rectification order, there are court proceedings to enforce that, um, which result in a penalty, but not the fix of the defects. 
And our main focus um, in setting up this program, running it and so on, is that defects get fixed. Um, we're not interested in having a, an allocation of blame or, or sort of an extensive discussion which um, penalises but doesn't result in the defects going away. So um, <clears throat> I will just also mention that before the developer signs the deed poll, there are lengthy discussions um, depending on the willingness of the developer, um, which doesn't ever start with a, a high level of willingness to work out what they've all, already done with the owners corporation. So if the developer is still around, they may be in litigation. They may have entered into a deed of settlement about some defects, which an expert that the owners corporation has hired um, has informed about. They may have already attended to the fixing of defects one, two, sometimes three times, especially in relation to water uh, leaking and so on. So we find ourselves walking into a nest of thistles where there are different parties um, who have spent money um, on the owners corporation side, 400, 500, 600, sometimes a million dollars in legal and expert fees. Um, and yet they still have defects um, in their building um, that are getting in relation to some of them, like water again, um, getting worse over time. So we're entering into a negotiation with the developer in an environment which is like that. So all credit to Yolanda and her team for getting a result in the um, undertakings. We also encounter reluctance from owners' corporations sometimes, and I think this is fair to say it's not totally occasional. And the reason for that is that sometimes uh, an owners' corporation has invested so much time and money in litigation that they want to see it through and get the promised outcome of damages out of the developer because there's, you know, there's been that sort of expectation set up. But as the survey Yolanda pointed to found, where litigation is pursued to the end, only 4% of defects were found to have actually been fixed. And then the owners corporation is stuck with um, an obligation to, to fix or get fixed or get a solution. So once the process deed poll is signed, work is done on the serious defects list. The list is the heart of the undertaking. It's what the developer will promise to do in the undertaking. The undertaking is enforceable by the secretary under the legislation. Um, so we're very keen to get that right and capture all the serious defects. So not all defects are in there, but all serious defects that we find will be in there. Also in there will be, apart from the ones that are found by the inspectors that we engage, will be the list of defects that the owners corporation will provide so that they're taken into account as well. The undertaking manager works with all of the parties. The undertaking is between the department and the developer only, but the owners corporation, their strata manager and other parties are important stakeholders in the process and are consulted as well but the actual undertaking is only between the secretary of the department and the developer. So the undertaking manager is the person who facilitates the move through the signing of the process deed poll, coming up with the list of defects to getting everybody in preparedness to sign the, the undertaking. So the developer signs the undertaking, but as a practical matter, unless the owners corporation agrees to go ahead with the process, it is not practical for a developer to go into an undertaking. The owners corporation has to grant access for work and accept that project intervene will be the mechanism by which the defects rectification will be delivered. Part of getting the remediation work done is that there is an independent su superintendent also appointed. That is to give comfort to the department as well as to the owners corporation that the fix will be done properly and in a compliant manner. The way that the owners corporation signs up to the project intervene process is by passing a motion at a general meeting to sign a deed poll. The deed poll is obviously shared with the owners corporation. And what we do with the owners corporation is have question and answer sessions in the lead up to that meeting so that um, those people who are in the um, building and interested um, can attend, ask questions and be satisfied, put forward their concerns um, so that the, um, the general meeting can be the place where a resolution is passed 
and there isn't um, you know, some uncertainty um, at that point. And we have a lot of materials that we can share with people to help them understand the process. So the fix, this is the remediation process that we follow under the undertaking. A great benefit to owners corporations is that the Design and Building Practitioners Act commenced in July 2021. That legislation really was inspired by the Shergold Weir report, which found that quite a lot of defects in these sorts of buildings occurred because the design was not concluded for the building, taking account of all of the different building elements that Bruce mentioned and, and matters such as where sprinklers go and then where um, the other shafts are. Um, I've just forgotten what that silver stuff is called, but anyway, um, where they go. Um, and um, so the Design and Building Practitioners Act requires that design is complete before building work starts. It's a huge change. And it's not a change which is made just for the benefit of project intervening. It is a change that's made in New South Wales for all building work. People have had to get um, their heads around this and their building practices um, changed to accommodate this, but it's a huge benefit for future owners corporations in buildings. The designs have to be prepared by a registered design practitioner or um, engineer as applicable and uploaded to the planning portal. So there's a whole um, benefit there where the owners corporation can access designs um, in the planning portal. I know that some owners corporations struggle to find plans, designs and other things that they should have about their building, um, you know, looking in boxes and whatnot. So the planning portal for, you know, those buildings that are captured by it um, provides that um, incidental benefit. All of this work is funded by the developer, the undertaking manager, the independent superintendent, are both jointly engaged by the developer and the department so that we can have a line of sight to work reporting any issues, but they're paid for by the developer and the owners corporation does not pay um, for them. The builder is engaged again by the developer um, after the designs are completed to prepare the work. The work has to be scoped. The undertaking manager is a person who's got construction industry experience and can understand the defects, the proposed solutions, and can check that the scope of work reflects the, the necessary work to be done. Superintendent is appointed and work commences. So then there is a time frame for the completion of the work and um, fixing of the defects. So all in all, um, in this particular um, process, it may be um, six to 12 months for the defects to be prepared when you take into account that the designs have to be done before any work can be commenced. However, when we compare to um, the owners corporations, we come across having three or four years of um, litigation, exchange of experts, reports and so on. It's a favorable outcome that defects um, are fixed at the end of the say 12 months, depending on what the defect is. So the elements of the undertaking, basically, I think we've sort of touched on them um, a bit. The defects list is at the heart of it, um, but it also contains the process um, for um, rectification and sign off at the end of it, that it's been done properly. It spells out the roles and responsibilities and warranties. It contains a dispute resolution process uh, where the undertaking manager is really looking to facilitate um, resolution of disputes um, rather than, you know, a more formal process. So far, that's worked very well. Um, you know, we're learning from each um, project and there's a sort of an element of um, parties having to sign up to this and then putting an effort in um, to avoid disputes. But um, so far, that is working well. Um, it also makes provisions about payment of costs, that is that the developer pays the costs, insurances and um, other indemnity requirements. Um, it specifies that the design has to be done, which is a requirement at law, but we just want to make sure the developer understands that we'll be insisting on that. So if an owner's corporation or their strata manager um, is authorised to sign up to Project Intervene, what can they expect? Um, the timing of each stage varies very much um, on 
the um, particular building, the owners corporation, how functional it is, um, where they're up to with dealing with their defects, how long they've been in the building and that sort of um, issue. Um, sometimes the owners corporation um, will feel that nothing is happening when in fact what we're doing is working on um, the defects list or some other aspect um, behind the scenes. We try to keep the owners corporation informed um, through the undertaking manager um, and there's always the uh, email address to send in to um, when an owners corporation is signed up to Project Intervene, just to check is something happening or not happening. But when there's action, the owners corporation is, um, is, to, um, is contacted and is involved. The primary contact for a Project Intervene project is the undertaking manager, and that person um, can uh, contact um, the owners corporation, can receive contact from them, uh, it's always preferred that there be an appointed person from the owners corporation, um, strata living being what it is, um, it's best that we don't try and sort of get involved in disagreements amongst owners um, about various things. So um, it's necessary for the owners corporation to get themselves a representative to speak to the undertaking manager and for that representative to tell others what is um, happening. Um, there's a website with information um, and there's an email address on that website where you can send a question if that website doesn't answer all of your questions. Thanks, Yolanda. Thank you, Elizabeth. So just recapping. So Project Intervene, what we're trying to uh, get to is an undertaking because we believe this is a better outcome in trying to um, resolve the serious defects in the collaborative manner, as well as you know, it has um, independent um, roles that oversee the process. So um, as Elizabeth mentioned, you've got the undertaking manager to oversee the process and ensuring each, all the parties are accountable and keeping to, as set out in the undertaking, the, the timeline, for example, if they set out the timeframe to have the remediation work completed, um, they can fa facilitate um, the communication between the parties, help with disputes, um, as well as you've got the um, appointment of an independent superintendent to um, oversee that the works are, are carried out in a compliant manner. The undertaking also sets out the um, agreed list of serious defects. So you know there's, there's a defined list um, and we'll try to get that finalized before we enter into an undertaking rather than you know, multiple reports going back and forth, multiple spreadsheets as um, we, we've seen um, in, in the projects that we're dealing with. So nobody knows what's the final list. So, um, it sets out, you know, uh, I suppose, um, you know, not just a final list, but there's, you know, uh, parameters within which you're working under. And I've uh, mentioned um, qualified independent person um, or people that they will have, the owners corporation will have access to. And I suppose most importantly, there is no cost to the owners corporation from participating in the program. Um, the remediation work, um, the burden for that is borne by the developer or the builder. Okay, so lastly, the criteria for registering for the program is that the, as I mentioned before, that there's an active developer or builder. We're looking at primarily buildings that are up to six years old because we feel that we can make the most impact for that cohort of buildings and that the buildings have serious defects, or at least the, the owners corporation believe that there are serious defects in the building. The process for lodging the matter is through the fair trading portal. Now, some of the key dates to note that the, um, as we mentioned, this is a surge project. So the, the deadline for registration for the program um, is the 30th of June, 2023. We're looking for an authorized representative to lodge the matter. So either the strata manager or um, a representative of the strata committee. Um, I've also mentioned that an ISO rated developer may also put forward their, their building. Now, I suppose the, the key takeaway for this is, I've obviously mentioned the, the benefits of this program, but for strata managers, if you are notified that there's serious defects in this building, you should really um, encourage Honest Corporation to consider this alternative or this option to have the serious defects remediated instead of um, pursuing you know, litigation as, as your first option. Because, you know, you know, why not try this option to see how we could assist you? 
I think that's probably the main message to take away. Yes. Um, maybe people have some questions now. Okay, thank you so much for the presentation. There's some really great information there. And we will, there's the link to the Project Intervene on the New South Wales Government site. And we'll move on to, to questions. So I guess one of the things that I was thinking about when we were speaking was if I was a, a lot owner sitting in this session today, I might not necessarily be on the committee, but certainly involved in my building. And I knew I had serious defects. Do I jump on today and, and fill out that form so that we're registered on time or what, what's the next step I would take? So um, we would prefer that uh, there be an authorised representative of rather than an individual owner um, because we're looking at serious defects in the common property. So if individual owner has noticed something, um, you know, in the common property, please raise it with your strata manager or the strata committee um, and agree to um, register for the program. Okay, thank you. And it also, we've mentioned that deadline a few times during the session, but we I mean, that was one of the reasons why we kind of chose the timing of now to let people know about it before the 30th of June. It does sound like it's a, it's a fair way away, but is it a long time or do you really have to start getting yourself um, organised now so that you make that deadline? Uh, the, the sooner the better. Okay, so there are some things that need to be done um, over that period before you can submit the application or is it a fairly easy process to do? Uh, it's a, it's a fairly, uh, well, I believe it's a fairly easy process. Um, you know, uh, just uh, get in contact with, if it's not the strata manager, get in contact with your strata committee, do strata manager, go look at our webpage. Um, there's some information there about how you can lodge and then the link to the fair trading complaint portal um, and to, to lodge the matter. It, try as much as possible to provide as much information so that we can um, consider the, the application um, to see that it meets the eligibility criteria. Um, we may reach out to um, the, the strata manager to seek further information if you believe like it's, it's you know, maybe, maybe not, you know, to, to definitively um, confirm whether it's in, in project intervene or not. The other thing to also um, understand if it doesn't fit the criteria of project intervene, um, fair trading may still also um, handle the matter. So even if you, you don't know if you're gonna meet the criteria, just uh, we suggest you just lodge the matter. So even if it doesn't meet uh, project intervene, fair trading may still um, handle the matter. Okay, so if you don't quite fit all the requirements that you've got in there, it's still a good idea to register. And is that, you're still saying the deadline for that too would be the 30th of June as well? So, uh, no, the program is only until 30th of June, um, but after that, fair trading will, will um, handle the matter. Okay, excellent. All right, thank you for that clarification. Uh, now, we had a question that came through from a strata manager in New South Wales. Do owners corporations need to engage experts to fill out the form to be able to explain in building defect speak what the main defects are? The concern is if the initial assessment is just based on the application form and they might get refused at the first step if they've not explained things well enough or not chosen the appropriate defects due to a lack of understanding or expertise. So, no, they don't. So we've provided um, some guidance about how you can, um, in terms of a lay person, uh, have looking at um, uh, trying to identify common serious defects. And I think Bruce pointed out some um, common things that we're seeing that, you know, lay person going around, say, you know, water ingress in the basement, um, you know, seeing excessive cracking, um, you know, water ingress, not just in the basement, obviously, um, into units. So those things, if they can um, show that um, through, you know, we provided some examples of how they can describe that. Enough for us to say, okay, we believe that there's serious defects, but we will go and do our own inspection to confirm that. Okay, and then they've asked if they do get refused, can another application be submitted with more information at a later date? If the application's refused, I mean, we'll they can contact us and just just you know just try to find out more, and we can like you know speak to them going you know, what have you got, so we can you know work through that. It's not as if it's it's the one and that's it. <laughs> so okay, they, that's really yeah, good. <laughs> get a response from us saying mm, doesn't quite meet, and, and then we will have that discussion and seeing if the strata manager can provide further information to us to to meet the eligibility criteria. Okay, that's great. And also, um, if an OC has already commenced litigation and withdrew due to expenses, can they still apply? Yes. 
Okay, excellent. All right, that was really good. Thank you. So if a building meets all of the requirements, but unfortunately misses the deadline, what other avenues are open to them? And you've mentioned New South Wales Fair Trading. Yes, th this program is like we're trying to get as many, um, I suppose, buildings that have serious defects and pull it into this program. But once that closes, Fair Trading will still manage the, the remainder. Oh, sorry, after that date. Uh, and you've mentioned that also a couple of reasons why an owner's corporation may be reluctant to participate. So can you just cover that in a little bit more detail? So um, the, the ones that we've come across, I've made that comment on the basis of the ones that we've come across. Um, sometimes they have um, the investment of money, sometimes almost a million dollars, um, quite commonly. Um, pursuing litigation, they're three years in and they have an expectation that, you know, they'll be successful and they'd like to see it to the end. And so that's fair enough. Um, uh, in other instances, there's an expectation that the owners corporation is going to get damages. Um, and with that money, we'll go and do the work, um, save some of the damages towards a sinking fund to do future maintenance work. Um, but statistics show that it's unlikely um, that an owners corporation would get so much in damages uh, successfully and enforce that um, judgment such that they would, you know, get an amount of money. They have an expectation there. Uh, sometimes there's a lack of trust by the owners corporation of the developer such that they don't want the developer involved in remediation works. Um, and, um, and that's probably about it. Okay, and I do believe it is the developer that you engage to come back in and, and complete the work. The legislation gives us powers in relation to the developer, so that's the person who paid for or inadequately paid for the original bill that caused the defects. So we, um, Parliament has said, look to that person to do the fix. Okay, thanks, Elizabeth. And we've also just been asked in the chat if the remediation has started but hasn't finished, does it still qualify for the project if they're partway through? That's a hard question. I think that that particular person should, um, building should apply and we can have a discussion and look to see. Um, it might be that um, the remediation is um, entirely misconceived. We have quite a lot of examples of um, experts providing solutions, particularly to water um, uh, proofing problems um, that are just misconceived and, you know, it, because the problem hasn't been properly diagnosed in the first place. Um, and uh, many owners corporations have, you know, water fixes that have happened more than one time and still been unsuccessful. Um, but it's best to just sort of um, make the application and see where it's up to. We can't interfere in a contract that the owners corporation has entered into for works um, and so on. But, you know, um, in a general forum like this, it's not possible to say, oh, no, don't worry about it. Um, you know, just uh, bring the information to our attention. It may be that it's not suitable, um, but, you know, um, when we see the specifics, we can answer, like, definitively. Okay, we had another question that came in that said our developer won't take phone calls and they uh, they won't um, talk to us. So how do we talk to the builder? I guess if they qualify for the requirements that you've got, they'd be best to put their application in and you may be able to deal with them and, and get some response. Yes, and I want to um, be very clear um, that people should be realistic. We don't succeed with every developer. Some developers uh, just don't cooperate um, with the department and um, we don't get an outcome from them. Um, so it's not a, um, oh, if you register for the program and get into it, that we can guarantee success. It is a negotiated outcome. Um, and that's why we, um, you know, we'll just sort of do our very, very best and over a period of time sometimes pursue the developer to enter into the undertaking because, you um, you know, for a reasonable developer, a business that wants to continue to build in New South Wales, it's a pretty good proposition. It shows that they're standing by their building, they're coming back to fix defects, they're a sort of developer that, you know, you should buy a unit from in the future because that's what they do. Um, and so um, also it saves them money on legal costs and expert costs. However, um, not every developer takes that uh, approach, so there's no guarantee that we can achieve an undertaking. Okay, and then on that uh, question as well, I think an extension of that, if the developer and builders have uh, phoenixed, is Project Remediate still a viable option for the OC? 
So if the developer is not available, the answer is a clear no. Um, I think the very first thing you said, Yolanda, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the developer must still be trading. Mm -hmm. We have all come across situations where the developer companies are a group of companies and they have special purpose vehicles for each side. Um, in some instances, we've negotiated with the sort of main company in the group and undertaking, even though the special purpose vehicle for the particular development has been wound up um, or, or put to sleep, um, you know, inactive. Um, so, you know, if that's happened to your building, still put your application in and we'll have a look. Um, but where the developer is being a rogue and has put themselves beyond reach by closing down a company, um, there really isn't much that we can do at this point in time. Legislation may change in the future, but at this point in time, there's nothing much we can do where that has happened. Okay. Yeah, I might just add to um, the, the application that goes in and even Sedgwick's involvement in the inspection, they're not exhaustive when the application goes in, as long as they can demonstrate that there's some serious defects, it doesn't need to list every defect in the building. They've really just got to demonstrate that there is defects and then our inspection it's not designed to be exhausted to weed out every defect in the building it's designed to stimulate some activity with the developer and get something moving so I think for anyone who's hesitating thinking they've got to come up with a massive comprehensive list of everything wrong with the building it's not necessary um, and I, I think that could be an obstacle sometimes too people fear they do have to do a lot of homework um, but I think the point is um, as Elizabeth pointed out it's, it's getting that negotiation going with the the developer because the quicker that happens the quicker we can avoid things like them potentially wanting to um you know um do a runner or or, or go down a different avenue it, it's the sooner the better is is probably what um we're encouraging okay thanks for that bruce now that we're this close to the, the deadline as well is there an extension will it be extended or will it definitely finish on that day do we know that yet so that's the date that we have at the moment. It's possible there might be an extension, in which case we'll announce it, but there isn't one at this point in time. There's certain, certainly been a huge response. Um, how many undertakings do we have now, Yolanda, about? Um, we've got seven, so the four um, about to be concluded. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so, um, and there is... 16 almost 100 buildings yes. that are coming through. So um, they're quite time consuming to get to the undertaking point. Um, and um, however, they're sort of, um, you know, good solid outcomes for the buildings that, you know, we've got them for, and they're going well. Another question said, if, if you have, they have major defects and they also have other smaller defects, does everything get fixed or do you just concentrate on the major defects? It's just um, serious defects because that's we're using the powers under the RAB Act. So that's all we're focused on is the serious defects. But the serious defects are the uh, causes the, the greatest impact on the building because it, it could uh, mean the um, safe occupation of the building. So you need to put everything into context, you know, like it's and it costs the most to actually um, remediate as well. All right. Well, thank you so much for um, jumping in today. It was really great to have you. It's a it's a wonderful um, project, and we were we're really happy to see it happening and um, to be able to to present the information to our uh, readers so they can get some benefit from that if they're experiencing the defects in their building. So thank you, uh, Yolanda and um, Elizabeth, for for joining us today, and thanks so much, Bruce, for joining us again. Just reiterating again, if you've got serious defects in your building and you meet the criteria please consider Project Intervene and register for the program. Look, um, certainly mirror those comments. Um, I've been in the industry a long time. I've never seen anything like this before. So um, people need to take advantage of that. These opportunities don't come around all the time. So now's the time to jump in. If you do um, have problems in a building, uh, it's certainly a good way forward. So yeah, um, encourage everybody to participate. Excellent. Thank you so much. Really positive message for everyone we're leaving you with. So yeah, we'll see you in the future and thanks for joining us. If you gained value from this video, please hit like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you're looking for information about parking, strata insurance, defects and more, head over to lookupstrata.com.au or sign up to our free weekly newsletter via the link in the description box below.